Hey y'all, welcome to All The Things Podcast, where we literally talk about all the things. This week's episode or episodes, we will be speaking on a topic that there's a lot of opinions on. People have and have framed their voice and opinions and what they think about this. And, you know, I myself have framed my own opinions on this based on what theology says, what culture says, but I wanted someone to speak on this from personal experience and for safety reasons, for the ability to be as vulnerable as possible, they will remain anonymous. And I personally think that's wise, um, because they do have a family and a lot was involved in this. So, uh, keep your eyes and ears open and just, I pray more than anything that you receive what the Lord has in this episode. There's so much that can be received and they are wise. They've been through it and they've been out of it. And God has shown his redemptive power through their story. So no introduction is needed for this episode because like I said, we'll keep this one anonymous. Um, but I just pray. I pray that someone's heart will be shifted. And if you are going through a divorce or you've been through a marriage that has just had just been super messy. I hope this brings you hope and some clarity. And for those of you who have judged and misjudged the idea of divorce, I hope that this gives you some um, some grounds to move your heart to see the big picture and uh, what truly the Bible says about divorce. So let's jump right into the story. Let's talk about your marriage. Let's talk about what it was like before the turning point, before things got uh, messy, what was marriage like? Yeah, okay, so um, I got married when I was about 21 years old. I was almost out of college and I was really excited for life. I had a new career, um, we had a new home, um, and so we were just in the middle of all those really exciting parts of being married and, and um, starting a life together. And so for the first couple of years, yeah, things were great. I mean, you know, just all the new things made everything fun and interesting. So um, I'm an educator, and so I began teaching, and, you know, it was just like a really, I remember it being a really um, fun time overall, for mm -hmm. sure. So you'd say just like any typical marriage started off great, was in the honeymoon phase, or I, honestly, I really don't like that term, the honeymoon phase, but <laughs> like any new marriage, um, things were really great. So what led to things becoming super messy? Did you notice anything? Did you see signs of things going downhill? W what was that turning point like? Okay, so, um, yeah, like, there's definitely a point where I can remember uh, things starting to change. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we had our daughter when, she, gosh, I think we had been married for like three years at that point. Mm -hmm. um, and so she was just an, a little newborn. And, you know, we were um, in the middle of all of the newborn um, stresses. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, anyone who has a child knows that those first couple of months can be really, really stressful, really yeah. difficult, very tiring. There's a lot of things that, you know, are exciting about children. And then at the same time, right when they are born, they're just so much and you're trying to recuperate yourself. So I remember it just being a really stressful time. Um, and I also remember that there was just a lot of other stresses happening in our lives. And so, um, my then husband, he commuted back and forth um, for work, and that was starting to become a really difficult thing. Mm -hmm. um, and putting in long hours, you know, things like that. Um, and as soon as it reached kind of a head, um, that's when I noticed things were starting to get really, really difficult. Yeah. Um, and I definitely saw a shift. Um, gosh, when. When things got really stressful, I remember that there was, um, you know, times where alcohol needed to be consumed in order just to de-stress. Wow. And that was new. Yeah. You know, that wasn't a thing that was happening like before then. And so that's kind of when I was like, mm, there might be something bigger going on yep. here for sure. And so, um, yeah, a couple of years of just living in that stress. We also um, decided that because of the commuting and all of the stresses that my then husband was, was trying to, um, go, you know, he was going through those things. Um, he, he had an opportunity to, um, move out of state and 
work from home half of the month. Mm-hmm. And so it seemed like, you know, the best decision considering all of the stresses that we were feeling at the time. Um, and he, I believe he was already traveling a little bit at that point. Yeah. But so we went, went ahead and we moved out of state. And um, that's when things really started to get rough. Yeah. So the travel um, was half, more than half the month at times. Wow. And I remember that when he was traveling, I, you know, obviously I felt pretty lonely. Um, I was, you know, basically raising our daughter by, our, by myself. And, mm-hmm. you know, when he did come home, um, all of a sudden, like things started to get different. I remember there was a lot of fights that were being picked. And um, I remember that, you know, um, when he was home, it still just felt like I was lonely. Yeah. And I didn't really understand why, you know, there were a lot of times where the fights, I, I really just felt very confused. Um, I didn't understand why, you know, the fight was happening. Mm -hmm. It was one of those ones where you're like, why are we even arguing? But it just continued (laughs) and continued and just kept getting worse. Mm -hmm. So lots and lots of times like that finally led up to, gosh, after five or six years of all of that stress and all of those things happening at home, um, one day he just left. And when he left, he didn't tell me why. Mm -hmm. He didn't say where he was, you know, going. he just said I needed to go and he packed his stuff and he left. And so we went a couple of days with just not knowing. I went without knowing like why this was happening yeah. and tried to reach out to him. And um, eventually by day three, I was really concerned, like what is happening? So I called our pastor at the time and I just said, Hey, can you reach out? You know, um, he's been gone for three days. I don't know what's going on. Mm-hmm. And um, so he did. And I remember that I just wanted to like get some, some free time, like just kind of de-stress myself. Right. And so I went shopping, which, you know, any girl would do in a stressful time. (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) I really, I don't even think I bought anything, but yeah, that's what I did. So I went shopping and then a couple of hours later, I got a phone call and I, and it was my pastor and he said, um, you need to go home. Your husband is going to meet you there. And so I thought, okay, well, you know, it kind of felt like a little glimmer of hope. Mm -hmm. Um, I went ahead and, um, went home and, um, my then husband came in. I remember that he didn't say hello to me when he walked through the door. He just went straight to the restroom. And when he came out, he sat down and told me that he had been living a double life for the last five to six years and that he had had multiple affairs. Wow. Over that time. And so um, I was completely blindsided. I had no idea. Yeah. And for so long, I had been lonely and confused about why I was so unhappy, what was happening with the fights, you know, that were happening back and forth. Mm-hmm. Um, just a lot of confusion. And then it was like, oh, okay, well, I guess that's why I was feeling the way I was feeling. Right. You weren't, um, it wasn't as if you were crazy or making things up. It was genuinely something behind it. Yeah, for sure. And and I guess at the time, like that part made sense, you know, Mm -hmm. okay, that's why we're, you know, this way. Yeah. But at the same time, you're just like completely shocked. Mm -hmm. And so the feeling is indescribable. I didn't know what to do at that point. Um, And so uh, we decided that we would take a couple of days to just kind of talk out what happened Mm -hmm. and um, work through some things. Um, And, you know, he was very remorseful at the time. And, you know, he, he said that he wanted to, um, rebuild our marriage. And so, um, we went on trying to do that. Yeah. And so we did that for gosh, a couple more years. Um, and when anytime that you are dealing with infidelity, I, I know for, in my experience, Mm -hmm. um, you as a couple have to decide if you're going to stay together, you have to decide like what that's going to look like because some changes have to be made. Yeah, You know, we have to rebuild things that have been broken. And so, um, when I, I think that when both people are completely invested in doing that, Mm -hmm. that it can definitely be saved. I do believe that. I, I know people that have had a great marriage after something like this. Yeah. And it's because I believe that they were both 100% in. Right. At the same time, when you have one person that's in and one person that's not, um, or kind of is, Mm -hmm. you know, is always on that line of maybe I am, maybe I'm not, Mm -hmm. things will unravel. Yeah. And that's what happened to us. 
So over the next couple of years, um, he went through a series of just really, really bad depression um, and anxiety, Mm -hmm. um, you know, because of the changes that had to be made. And, you know, it was one of those difficult things for sure. So I I have a couple questions on that, going through that process. You said you, you had no clue that he was living a double life, that there was no indication that that was happening um, in the counseling appointments and in the, you know, talking through the process and trying to work on it. Did he ever alluded to, oh, this is something I struggled with um, as a child or uh, growing up as a teenager? You know, it, is was it a, was there a deeper sin that led to the infidelity? Um, so I learned later on, even after that shocker, I learned later on that those types of things had been happening since even before we were married. Wow. Um, there was, you know, like I said, in the beginning, things were really great. Mm -hmm. Um, I believe from what I know that that, that kind of honeymoon period that we were talking about Mm -hmm. earlier, um, that was probably some of the only years that that wasn't happening. Wow. So that did come out later on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, I don't know about what the childhood part of that looked like, but I do know that it wasn't something that was brand new to him. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So it's fair to say then that whatever he struggled with before marriage kind of suppressed during the honeymoon phase and then resurfaced and reared its, reared its ugly face, um, pretty, pretty harsh, you know, during that period of time when he was honest and said, Hey, this is, this is what I've been doing. And he chose not to be all in, in terms of the reconciliation part. For sure. Yeah. Hmm. And that was like, you know, confusing in itself. And so um, over the course of the next five years after um, I was told about the double life um, with the depression and everything else, Mm -hmm. it got really difficult because I started to feel um, like I wasn't being heard. Hmm. And I started to, you know, ask questions like, you know, are you all in? You know, is this is this, um, something that you continuously, like you want to continue, you know, um, things like that. And I would get like kind of halfway answers yeah. and that started making me feel like so unworthy, Mm -hmm. you know, like I was like, gosh, what did I ever do? You know, why, why do I feel this way? Why are you making me feel this way? Mm -hmm. And I would ask, you know, I was trying to communicate as best I could. I would ask a lot of questions and, you know, either I wouldn't get a response or a response was just confusing in nature. And, and I learned later on that that's, you know, that's called emotional abuse. And, um, that was really hard for yeah. sure. And we went on and on like that for a long time. So at what point was divorce the only option? Um, so, uh, towards the end of that marriage, um, he began saying things like, you know, if I move out of state, things will get better. If we mm-hmm. move, things will get better. Mm-hmm. At that point, I had been through 13 years of struggle. Wow. And I, I looked around and thought like the only time that I am completely happy is when I'm doing what I love at work or when I'm hanging out with my daughter and my family, Mm -hmm. you know, and those were all where we lived. And so I couldn't, I couldn't uproot myself from that because I just didn't know what was on the other side. Yeah. And, you know, that was the point where. I just said, like, listen, could you do a couple of things here first? Could you try to make yourself, you know, um, better here? Could Mm -hmm. you work on your, could you start counseling, you know, things like that um, to try and see if maybe there was some hope Mm -hmm. that things were going to change? Because at that point it had been so long of living that same life, you know? Yeah. And so um, there was never a yes. There was never a, yeah, I will do that. Yes. Things will get better. Things are going to be so much better on the other side. I never had that response. And so I couldn't possibly move, but I would plead like, please, could you just try and and work on things here? Yeah. Um, and a lot of that was because, you know, when you have children too, you don't want to uproot them, Mm -hmm. you know, Uh, they, especially when there's a circumstance like this at home, like you don't want to, to, 
you want to keep things consistent for mm-hmm. your children. And so, um, yeah, I, I just beg and plead it all the time. Like, no, we uh, can we please just work on things here? And that didn't happen. Mm-hmm. Um, and then eventually um, he left again. Oh, wow. And yeah. And so one day he just stopped talking to me. A couple of days later, he picked, he packed up his stuff and he moved out. And then a couple of days after that, um, I saw a charge on our bank card for a gas station out of state. Wow. And that's how I, that's how I found out that he had left the state and he wasn't taking us with him mm. and he didn't, he didn't ask. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, that was kind of how that was. I, I did call and make sure that, you know, that was confirming like mm-hmm. you are in another state type of a thing. And yep. yeah, the answer was yes. And so at that point, um, there wasn't much else to do. Right. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And so that's how the divorce came. And, and that's be. because you've gave, you've given it at that point, 13 years of your life, trying and trying and trying, giving suge- su- suggestions and probably even working on your own self, hoping that this might produce some type of change and only for it to result to silence and just gone without yeah. any warning. Yeah. Wow. For sure. Okay. So how did you find yourself again? I think for many women and men who have gone through some type of tragic event when it comes to relationship, finding yourself is one of the hardest things because with separation or with a heartache or heartbreak, I feel like there is a lot of self-reflection. I could have done something different. Maybe it was me. How did you find yourself again to be you and fully you without holding on to any type of regret, any type of uh, self-infliction and self-blaming? How did you find yourself? Well, um, so the first thing that I, I probably did was just realizing what had happened to me right Right after, you know, he left, I, I started doing a lot of research about just relationships Mm -hmm. and, um, I started learning a lot about passive aggressive behaviors. Um, something called a word salad, which just means like a lot of words that make you feel very confused, Mm -hmm. um, ways of making people feel like small, um, or like, you know, their opinion doesn't matter mm-hmm. without actually saying your opinion doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, things that are kind of like gaslighting, yep. um, manipulation, those types of things. And so a lot of those things that I was reading about began ringing true. I noticed that that sounded a lot like what I was dealing with. Yep. It's interesting that, you know, when you're in a relationship, sometimes it's really hard to see what's actually happening. Mm. So, you know, I believe that those things started happening very subtly at first. Right. And then towards the end, it got worse and worse and worse. And towards the end, it was super clear, like, wow, that's exactly what's happening. I was being emotionally abused. Mm -hmm. And so once you realize that and you do a little bit of your homework, you know, you you find out that a lot of the things that are um, happening as when you're being abused in that way emotionally, um, it's not about you it's actually about them Mm. and so the person who is doing that to you is typically um, extremely insecure um, with themselves Mm -hmm. and does that to kind of gain control in a sense and so I I did a lot of research and realized like that was what was happening you know and um, when you know that and when you understand that nothing that I could have done was going to change that you Mm -hmm. know like there was nothing on my side that I could have done that was going to say like, oh yeah, sure. You know, now I'll, I'll change and yeah. now I'll be better. Like I couldn't, the, I believe a hundred percent that the outcome would have been the same. And so that I believe is freeing to me because, um, I was able to look at it and go, you know, I did everything that I could, yeah. like whatever God wanted me to do as a wife, I did that. And I was constant, constantly praying, or I was being very consistent in like, just letting the Lord know, like, I will continue to follow you. I will continue to do the ministries that you've put before me. I will continue to do all of these things, Mm -hmm. knowing that you're going to take care of me. Yeah. And, um, he did, you know, and in the end, like I understood that that's what was happening to me. I was able to go like, 
wow, like that wasn't about me, yep. you know? Yeah. And the Lord did take care of me in that way. And so first, I think I, I realized what had happened to me. Mm -hmm. The second thing um, that kind of, you know, resonates when you ask that question is like, um, I had to figure out like really and truly who I was. Mm -hmm. And the way to do that is just really by like asking God, like, what do you say about me? Yep. Who, who am I to you? And going into the word and digging deep and finding the answers. And so, you know, you do deal with a lot of self-doubt and mm -hmm. you do deal with a lot of like, what did I do? Why am I, why is this happening to me? You know? And so a lot of negative thoughts begin to creep in mm -hmm. and the enemy can just really rattle your brain with that. Yeah. And so um, a good friend of mine, she gave me this tool, this strategy that she talked about that she had used before. And so she drew this T chart out for me on a piece of paper. And on one side, she wrote what I'm thinking about myself. And on the other side, she wrote what God says about me. Wow. And so um, when I was saying things like, I'm all alone, mm. on the other side, I would go into the word and I would just like read. And if I couldn't find what I was looking for, I would Google it, girl. I was like, listen, <laughs> I need answers. What does God say about me being yep. lonely? Mm -hmm. And I learned that he says, like, I will never leave you nor yep. forsake you. Yep. And I would write the scripture, Hebrews 3, 13, 5, mm -hmm. you know? And then there were times um, where I would say things like, I've been rejected. Yeah. Like, gosh, that sucks. <laughs> <laughs> I've been rejected. Like that is such a down feeling. And then on yeah. the other side, I was like, okay, let's see what God says about that. Yep. And there's a verse in Romans that says, I am accepted. Mm. Like God accepts me. Yeah. I said, I'm weak. God said, for when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Yeah. Second Corinthians 12. Like that strategy helped me so much because I began seeing that it wasn't really about what man says about me. It was about what God says about me. And right. that allowed me to have my freedom and my self-worth back. Wow. I feel like in that process, you had to lean and you mentioned your friend, you had to lean on people. I, I don't know about you, but for me, whenever going through anything that's scarring, it's hard to trust people again. Did you find that as an issue or did you lean on people and find good people to lean on and trust and confide in like your friend that helped you with understanding what that identity looks like. Yeah, I definitely leaned on people. Okay. Um, I had a, a close circle. And so that was great. Um, I had, you know, work friends, I had um, church friends, I had family, you know, I did have a huge support system. Yeah. And I definitely leaned on them during that time. Like I had a couple of close friends who were my people that I could call any time of the day or any time of the night, because it really does get dark, especially mm -hmm. at night. Yeah. Um, you know, literally and figuratively, like it gets dark. Like you can think a lot of horrible things in the middle of the night when you're up and going, why is this happening to me? Yeah. And so I had friends who um, I could call day or night and I did. Mm -hmm. um, and they were just good listeners. They were people who um, allowed me to just talk. Yeah. And they were also, the, I call them my wise counsel because they literally are those people who I know have been walking with the Lord for a long time right. and they're able to just speak truth into your life. Yeah. You know, they're listening to you and then they're able to just speak truth. So I definitely had a support system that yeah. I was able to lean on for sure. And that's biblical. I, I believe it's in Psalms or Proverbs. It says to seek wise counsel. And too often, whenever we're going through any trial, the natural response is to remain alone, remain in that rut. But I mean, I think this is an encouragement to anyone who's going through anything. It doesn't have to be divorce or separation. Whatever you're going through, if it if your natural response is to crawl into a shell, to seek wise counsel and to not be afraid to ask for help. Mm -hmm. For sure. So how did you or have you rewritten your story? I think that's important for listeners who, you know, have gone through this or is currently walking through this, or it could be something entirely different, rewriting them their story after something tragic, because 
for, I know for me, for my story, I've always carried that part of my life with me. And that tainted part had always remained a tainted part until God did a a, a shift. And he was like, Hey, no, this is, yes, this is the part of your story, but this isn't the peak of who you are. So I'm curious to know, have you rewritten your story? Has the Lord worked on you with that? Have you gone through that process? Yeah, I I definitely think that um, I've rewritten my story. So like starting over is never easy, Mm -hmm. you know, like I'm this, I've only done it once, but (laughs) starting (laughs) over is never easy. Like after almost 20 years with a person, whether good or bad, you get used to certain things, you know, and when that goes away, you really have to learn pretty quickly, like how to pick up your big girl pants and press on, (laughs) you know, it wasn't like, and for me, it wasn't like just rewriting my story. It was like beginning a whole new book called my life. Mm. And Wow. The trick for me is to not have expectations. Like I couldn't have expectations at that point because I didn't know what the future looked like. Right. And so to rewrite your story is, is just to allow the Lord to like do something, mm-hmm. you know? And, and that's what I did. I trusted that God was going to do something. Did I know, you know, was I ever going to find love again? Or was, was my life going to be a single mom, you know, type of a lifestyle for forever? I had no idea. Mm. And at that point, I just wanted to crawl into the Lord's wing and wait. Mm. And so in order to rewrite my story, that's, that's what I did. I had to do that. I just trusted that God was going to take care of me. You know, for a long time, I had longed for things and they never came to fruition. Um, You know, I longed to have a bigger family. I longed to have another baby. I longed to, um, you know, be loved like I loved someone, you know, and all those desires were there yeah. and I would just pray and continue to do whatever it is that God called me to do, knowing full well that, you know, the scripture that says that, you know, he is faithful to complete the works that he started in you. Absolutely. Like that stayed with me. Like, yeah. I know that you're going to complete my story. This is not the end, mm-hmm. you know, for any part of my life. Yeah. And I was just going to wait and see how God wanted to rewrite that. And he definitely rewrote it. God had some glory to show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it also took you, you making that step to say, hey, Lord, here, here I am. Wreck me and do what only you can do in my life. Um, yeah. You didn't reject that moment of brokenness or not moment, but moments of brokenness. And you desired for him to rewrite your story. Yeah. Wow. And I definitely needed to have like that time for God to wreck me. And Mm -hmm. I did. I dove in deep. I mean, I was constantly in my word. I was praying night and day. I was um, looking for ways to be a part of ministries at church. I was um, making sure that I stayed in my word with other people. And so a group of friends uh, from work we decided that, you know, we're educators. And so the summertime was a great time to really dive into the word. And we, we had a Bible study together and, um, that was, wow. that was just a, a bunch of women who were in different parts of their life, you know, supporting each other and mm-hmm. holding each other up with the best thing to do that with, which is the word of God. Wow. For sure. Well, speaking of others, how did this divorce affect your home, affect your family? Um, did you receive any type of stigma, backlash or repercussion from initiating or I, I don't want to say init- I don't want to say initiating, but from resulting to, hey, this is what I have to do in order to move forward. He doesn't want to find the help. Um, did you even have to explain yourself or do you think that listeners need to explain themselves and justify, you know, why they chose the route of divorce. I know that's a lot, but um, how did how did all of this affect people around you? Yeah, so um, I definitely my my response to that would be simply like, do I think that anybody owes anybody an explanation um, as far as what happened in that relationship? No, I okay. don't. I believe that you know, if somebody wants to know my testimony or my story, I will be glad to share with them because right. I do believe that the Lord takes us through these things so that we can help others. Right. Absolutely. At the same time, you know, um, definitely like the next time that I went to church, people were wondering, you know, why we're alone or, mm. you know, um, and so I definitely did have to explain like, just, you know, 
what kind of the life changes that were happening in our family. And, yep. you know, I didn't really have to go into much detail, but mm-hmm. I did just, you know, let people know gently, like, here's, here's what happened. And yeah. Here's what, what we're doing now. Um, and as far as like other people, you know, um, I, I do believe that people in that time are just so compassionate. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of the responses that we got were just love, wow. you know, people just wanted to love on us. Yeah. Like, a, a friend of ours sent us um, an edible arrangement, you know, just something <laughs> that was so sweet mm-hmm. and something that she knew we enjoyed. Blessed yeah. my heart. And, and people were writing me notes and, you know, just like the compassion that they were showing because they knew we were going through a difficult time right. was so big. But um, I definitely do think that, that it does come up because people want to know the differences in your life. But I don't necessarily, you know, think that... You, if somebody wanted to know all the details, it would, it's my, you know, decision whether I want to um, share everything with them or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for listeners who have children, who have people who have family around and, you know, their story might be completely different and uh, they're contemplating a divorce. They've tried, they've gone to counseling, they've exhausted all their options. They've expressed, you know, Hey, I want to work on this. I don't want to lose this relationship. Uh, we have children involved or we have a child involved. What, what would you encourage them to do? Because I know there's a, a lot of people have their own opinions on divorce. And for you, I, first of all, I want to say, I don't want to end this episode without acknowledging your heart and your persistence to not give up. That is huge because I know there are certain people where, you know, if infidelity is involved, I'm sorry, I'm out. There's, there's no second chances, but you Mm -hmm. gave second, third, fourth, fifth chances over and over for 13 years trying to work on this. And, you know, I, that's this huge, that shows your heart, that, that shows your willingness to forgive. And to the extent that you would forgive is beyond what most people would do. So for listeners who are in that current position where they've exhausted all all their options. They've given it their all. And the other party is just either not willing to cooperate. They don't want to change or they say they'll change and they they go right back into it. What do you encourage them to do at that point? I think the only thing that I can really encourage somebody who's in a situation like I was Mm -hmm. is to constantly stay um, connected to Jesus. Wow. Just stay connected and listen to his voice. Yeah. You know, find time. And and what I did was write. I I found an outlet, you know. For me, writing is extremely therapeutic. And so I would find a quiet space and I would just write. You know, my fingers were just moving on this computer like um, fast and furious because I had so many feelings and thoughts that I needed to get out. Right. And I couldn't necessarily share all of those things with somebody. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, that was just kind of my way to do that. I would, I would highly suggest finding an outlet, but more than anything, I would say staying connected to hearing the Lord's voice and right. not just having that outlet, but also just spending time in the word, spending time in prayer. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the Lord is going to um, give you um, the, the things that you need. Mm-hmm. You know, he's never going to leave you with nothing. Yeah. And I always had a full heart after my time with him. Mm-hmm. And I would do that often because I just needed to be refilled because I wasn't being refilled by other people. And, I, you know, at the end of the day, I know that I shouldn't have been looking for that. Yeah. But, but you do, you, you know, you trust that the people who you love that are in your life are going to fill your bucket. And when they don't, you know, yeah, it, the the need to be refilled is there and only God can really do that. You Absolutely. know, so my suggestion would just be to stay connected to the Lord during that time and, and listen for what he is telling you mm-hmm. and he'll make a way. He will make a way. And I do have one more question before we take a break here and transition to the second part of this episode. Um, how did you protect your daughter? How did you protect her from not viewing her dad as someone horrible, because at the end of the day, that's still, that's still her father, you know? And I mean, I don't know what the right or wrong thing to do is, but how did you protect her? How did you keep, how did you separate the hurt and allowed your daughter to still view him as a father? 
Yeah. So um, that's a great question because like, you know, usually when somebody has been hurt, um, you know, they might just want everybody to know, you know, like oh, yeah. I've been hurt. This person's hurt me. Um, but again, like I would really say just be very mindful um, about everyone around you. Mm -hmm. And when I say that, I mean, like f for your children, for example, you know, the thing that they really truly need is communication, they yep. need consistency. Um, kids just need their consistent things that they had before. And so um, my encouragement would be simply to um, communicate with your kids, mm -hmm. you know, talk to them about how they're feeling. Um, it doesn't even mean that you need to just, you know, tell them exactly what happened. You know, be mindful of their age. Like, you know, my daughter was um, a preteen at the time. And so, wow. you know, she didn't need to know all of the things yeah. yet, you know, and, and it's up to me to decide like when and where I would like to share those things. And if I would like to share those things, right. because you do have to remember like her, her view of her parent is important. Mm -hmm. And, you know, being mindful of that she, she is the one who is going to be able to, um, create that relationship to yep. continue that relationship on her own. But as a parent, I, I believe that our job is to just make sure that they are happy, that they are healthy, that mm -hmm. they are con having the consistent things in their life that they had before yeah. as much as possible. And it, that they obviously, they need somebody to communicate with. And let me tell you, sometimes, you know, that's not me. Like, <laughs> like there are times where, where my daughter's like, mm, maybe not you today, mom, but she definitely has. <laughs> and that's the truth. You know, that's with any parent relationship with their kids. Like there's some days where we can definitely sit down and talk, but other days where she just needs somebody else, yeah. you know, and she definitely has the family members and friends, um, that she trusts yeah. that she'd be able to talk to if she needed to. So for your kids, I, I really just say like consistency is important. Communication is important. That's huge. That is definitely huge. I, I do have family who has had divorce for other reasons. And one of the biggest thing I commend is always never bad mouthing the other parent, even though what they did was wrong and messy, but keeping that relationship or that line still open. I mean, and every, every circumstance is different. There's cer certain circumstances where that line cannot be open. That line of communication, um, cannot be there because that parent might be, um, harmful to the child. But for mm -hmm. the most part, the ones that I know who have been through a divorce, uh, they've been very kind to the other spouse in how they talk about them and they allow the child to make their own, understanding of who their parent is. Um, and, and I think that's good, but again, every situation is different. So, um, For sure. you definitely have to have wisdom and discernment when navigating that, but yeah. we're yeah. going to take a break before we jump into the second part of this episode. Um, I just want to say thank you, you know, for being so vulnerable open about what you've gone through. And I'm excited to hear this, the, the, the responses you have, um, to the questions for this second part. And I, I think this part is the most important part too, because we're, we'll be talking about healing who God is, um, finding hope, joy, and love, and then now moving beyond, uh, what divorce is. So yeah, 